The Ouroboros Cycle, Part 4. So far throughout this series, we've discussed gods and mortals, sacrifice, atonement, morality, responsibility, and irresponsibility. In the fourth part of the cycle, the way it ends, all of these concepts come together to complete the story. The way it ends is simultaneously connected to the previous parts, as well as its own tale, and while it takes place in the same continuity as the other parts, it will only briefly touch upon them. It's really the various themes of the cycle that bind the whole thing together. The way it ends is a very lengthy story, with plenty of dialogue between the various characters. Since this is not a reading video, there will definitely be something lost in summary, but I will not omit anything essential to the overall story. The way it ends starts with the classic super secure disclaimer that is standard for most 001 files, but the special containment procedures simply read, it is the imperative of the Overseer Council to establish containment of SCP-001. The description reads, To know the nature of SCP-001 is to know the nature of the Foundation. For more information, see the attached document. This really does not tell us much at all other than the fact that the Overseer Council's whole purpose seems to be containing this 001, whatever it is. The attached document starts with a poem seeming to discuss Adam and Eve after they were cast out of the Garden of Eden. Adam rebukes the snake for leading them astray and tricking them, saying that trusting it was his greatest mistake. The snake replies that his greatest mistake was believing that he had a choice at all. With that, let's dive in. The attached document is not an SCP Foundation file at all, but instead belongs to another organization the Chaos Insurgency. We know that in the first part, the children, O5-1, used the children to kill the administrator of the Foundation and led a bunch of defectors to start the Chaos Insurgency. We know that the Chaos Insurgency is opposed to the Foundation, and with the way it ends, we're going to find out why. The document opens with a slick logo and the motto of the Insurgency, should intermittent vengeance arm again his red right hand to plague us. The line is taken from Paradise Lost by John Milton, when Belial argues to his demonic peers that they should not seek war with the forces of heaven, as they would only serve to further anger God. In this case, the leaders of the Chaos Insurgency fear the full might of the Foundation as punishment for their rebellion. The foreword reads, we, the Delta Command, do hereby set in motion the principles of this document, the Summa Modus Operandi, of the Chaos Insurgency. Summa Modus Operandi basically means their principal mode of operating, or in other words, why they were formed in the first place. Delta Command of the Insurgency believes that the overseers of the Foundation have altered the fabric of reality for the benefit of their own wicked desires and these alterations are the source of all supernatural activity in our universe. This means that, in the eyes of the insurgency, the overseers are responsible for creating the very problems the Foundation seeks to solve, and they've done this for their own selfish reasons. The document continues with a list of the 13 overseers, and a short line for each discussing what each of them has done wrong. I won't go through this list right now, as we'll be looking at each Overseer individually. It continues by saying that the Overseers and their anomalous influence have created a wound on the fabric of the universe, and that wound can't be healed until they are removed. The Chaos Insurgency stands in opposition to this blasphemy against nature, and it also says that they stand insurgent against this chaos. A nice twist on what we normally think of Chaos Insurgency. In order to clean the wound and let the universe heal, the 13 overseers of the SCP Foundation must be destroyed. This mission statement was first put into place by the engineer of the Chaos Insurgency, its founder, 
the former 051. What follows then is the actual meat of the document, 13 separate sections for each of the 13 overseers. This is where the story really begins. In the back room of an abandoned Somali warehouse, a man named Calvin Lucian meets with the High Council of the Chaos Insurgency, known as Delta Command. Delta Command had been formed by the Engineer to bring together the seven different branches of the insurgency, and according to legend, the name of the organization came from the Engineer stating, Never in history has a more chaotic insurgency been mishandled into existence. As we well know, the Chaos Insurgency is not a very cohesive group, and Delta Command is fairly representative of that fact. Calvin was a decorated CI agent who understood that the insurgency wasn't there to ever destroy the Foundation, but instead act as a thorn in their side to keep them in check. Calvin was very good at his job though, and had acted as a bit more than a thorn throughout his career to the point of he was considered for promotion to Delta Command. He had been falsely accused of mishandling insurgency resources around that time, however, and the promotion went to someone else. The current Delta Command doesn't especially care for Calvin, and they wear their disdain fairly openly. Calvin had called this meeting because he claims that he has recovered a journal, a very important journal as it turns out. Before discussing this journal, however, Calvin starts by presenting a report that concerns the Foundation's testing of anomalies. These tests have continually exacerbated the problems initially created by the anomalies themselves, and the problem is getting worse, spiraling toward a point of no return, as Calvin puts it. It's likely at some point in the 2020s that there will be some major public event and within five years of that, things will be too much for even the Foundation to contain. We heard similar things from the Entity in Part 3. Delta Command is unsure where Calvin is going with this, as the Insurgency's purpose is to inhibit the Foundation's efforts, and Calvin seems to want to interrupt them entirely. Calvin replies that he intends to uproot the Foundation entirely, leaf and stem, causing Delta Command to break out in laughter. The laughter comes from the fact that taking down the world's most powerful and secretive organization is no small feat. Calvin goes on to discuss the Summa Modus Operandi, a document written up by the first Delta Command, and apparently practically forgotten about by the current Delta Command. Calvin summarizes it by saying that they don't have to take down the entire Foundation, they just have to take down the Overseers. Also not a small feat as each one of them is pretty much an immortal demigod protected by unknown amounts of anomalies. Just the concept of finding them would typically be impossible, unless you had a certain journal, which Calvin does. This journal was written by one of the top agents of the Global Occult Coalition, who we'll refer to as Agent U, and comprises his report on each of the Overseers. It's important because it supposedly contains the location of a couple overseers who have never been seen before, ever. This includes 0513, who has apparently made a deal with death, assuring immortality for all of the overseers. Since you can't kill death, it makes it pretty hard to kill the overseers, but Calvin says that he doesn't have to kill death, he just has to break death's contract. To show how he might do this, he produces a small vial of liquid from his pocket, which causes Delta Command to break into a flurry of chaos. Delta Command begins to believe that this endeavor might be possible, with Calvin explaining that he is planning to take down each Overseer in order, resulting in the SCP Foundation falling apart. With the Overseers removed, the universe can begin to heal from the wound they created and someday they'll wake up in a world free from the supernatural. Delta Command approves the mission, and Calvin sets out to deal with 0513. Each file is accompanied by the section of Agent U's journal discussing each overseer, so let's look at 0513's info. Agent U says that at one point, the O5 Council had access to the Fountain of Youth, SCP-006 
which kept the council perpetually young and healthy, but they were still susceptible to dying in many ways. To fix this problem, they conducted an occult ritual involving bringing a person to the brink of death and keeping them in that state. This would summon death itself, who would come to finish the job and collect their soul. This role fell to 0513, a physicist named Felix Carter, who was likely among the first overseers handpicked by the administrator. The ritual was performed, the avatar of death appeared, and 051 proposed a deal. Death would receive 0513's life, and a seat on the council, in exchange for granting the overseers immortality. The deal was struck, and 0513 was kept in a near-death state. To protect his body from any tampering, they hid it in a very remote location. Agent Yu doesn't know exactly where it is, but he writes that there is a location in the South Atlantic where sailors occasionally report feelings of something they can't identify or see, a strange presence. Agent Yu says that this must be the effects of an anti-meme, something that humans are normally incapable of perceiving. To perceive it, a human would have to be under the effects of a nestic, the opposite of an amnestic, something designed to make you remember rather than make you forget. Since the Foundation controls the world's limited supply of nestics, it would be difficult to get a hold of some. He remarks, however, that the Coalition found out that dark rum exposed to sea air has a very mild nestic property, which, when combined with laudanum, would explain the stories of some sailors who spoke of a towering black spire. Agent Yu is not sure if there's any truth to these stories, but he writes that if the Foundation did want to hide 0513, an imperceptible prison deep in the world's roughest sea would be the likely place. With that in mind, let's get back to Calvin. Calvin asked Delta Command for three individuals to join his team, a group small enough to slip past the all-seen eye of the Foundation. The first individual is Anthony Wright, one of the top insurgency agents who is currently in his 50s. He's been a voice of reason and direction for decades, but has always passed on a promotion to Delta Command. The second is Olivia Torres, who had built a reputation in the anomalous art community, and had recently been pursued by the Foundation, causing her to flee into the insurgency, making her a somewhat recent recruit. The third is Adam Ivanov, a young and inexperienced agent who is practically a prodigy with computers, but next to useless with a firearm. Calvin had trained and fought alongside Anthony for quite a while, and had known Olivia for some time as well, meaning both were happy to join Calvin's team. Adam had taken a bit more convincing, but when he had found out that Anthony was on the team, he quickly agreed. Adam had spent his youth as a D-class within the Foundation, assigned to SCP-610 due to his parents being Ukrainian political prisoners. Anthony had been a part of the team that had raided the labor camp, carrying Adam out of danger himself. Three months after meeting with Delta Command, the small team was on a ship in the southern Atlantic, sailing towards a jagged black spire looming in the distance. The Foundation hadn't built this prison. It had likely been built by mysterious people over 100,000 years ago, and the Foundation had just repurposed it. The team was on nestics, allowing them to see the spire, but they wouldn't last forever, so they had to work quickly or they'd soon be completely unable to even perceive that it exists. The crew purposefully wrecks their boat in order to get on land, as it's quite an inhospitable location, and Calvin goes ahead alone into the prison. Inside, he takes a freight elevator down into the earth, unable to say how long the descent took. At the bottom, he finds a massive chamber lit by torches emitting green flames, the walls carved with ancient runes. A walkway extends to the middle of the room, the rest of the floor missing as a yawning darkness extends below. In the center stands a column of stone, and on it, 
a solitary folding chair containing a human corpse bound by golden chains. A mocking laughter fills the chamber as Calvin approaches, and a voice comes from the corpse. The voice is that of death, and Calvin asks it what the terms of its contract with the council are. Death had granted them life everlasting in exchange for a seat at their table, 0513's seat. 0513 is still alive, as his life is insured just like the other overseers, but they gave death his body, kept perpetually in a state of near death. Calvin proceeds to pull out the vial of liquid and pour it down the corpse's throat, causing 0513's body to return to a healthy condition. Since it's no longer near dead, the contract with death is broken, and 0513 witnesses the protection of death leaving him just before Calvin pulls out a pistol and shoots him twice. He then throws the corpse off the edge and finds a silver woman draped in darkness standing next to him. This is the actual avatar of death, who solemnly confirms that the contract is broken and she will not stay her hand against the other twelve. Before leaving, Calvin asks her why she didn't stop him, as she easily could have. Death admits that there is something festering at the heart of the council, something that will not die. She accepted the contract because she thought it would get her close enough to whatever it is to kill it, but she couldn't. She says there are things in this world even beyond her reach. Calvin returns outside, seeing the Delta Command sent another boat to fetch the group. They've lost the element of surprise now, and the other overseers are going to be a lot more wary. One down, twelve to go. 0512 is known as the Accountant, and Agent Yu says that he is one of the more interesting members of the Council. 0512 was born Omar Yulao in a small village in Uganda and soon found himself employed in a small Ugandan accounting firm, gaining a reputation for performing calculations faster than any calculator. The Foundation discovered his existence, and he was placed on the Council soon after. 0512 is said to be the world's premier mathematical prodigy, with an ability to perform complex abstract arithmetic that is almost certainly anomalous in nature. Most spectacularly, 0512 can perform the calculations necessary to accurately predict the outcome of seemingly random probabilities, nearly flawlessly. He has used this ability to predict the rise and fall of various nations, as well as the actions of other potentially hostile groups. Agent Yu writes that, although he can predict the outcome of events that are affected by other events, he doesn't do so well with predicting isolated events, such as guessing a number a person might be thinking of. He tends to stay around areas with active markets, such as New York, London, Hong Kong, and Tokyo, but he'll likely be a very difficult person to take down, and he must be taken by surprise. Agent Yu also says that he sets his entire routine around local train schedules, as that's his favorite way of traveling. The story continues with two members of the Overseer Council discussing the recent death of 0513, and they are both angry, confused, and somewhat afraid. As Calvin said, they've lost the element of surprise now, as the whole council is going to double down on security. Calvin's team is going to take down the Accountant next, as he's responsible for the Foundation's financial might. Also, conveniently, he's the next in line, after 13. Adam explains that the accountant is a data sponge, capable of absorbing and analyzing information faster than computers, predicting the boom and bust of a Fortune 500 company based on a train schedule, as he sees invisible patterns no one else can. These patterns aren't anomalous, just his ability to see and understand them. Adam found that there's some sort of weird correlation between international housing markets and train schedules printed in Tokyo on the fifth day of every third month, and he bets that the accountant goes to Tokyo himself to examine these schedules the day they're printed. 
Unfortunately, he's also able to use this anomalous ability to make predictions about exactly when and how someone would try and kill him. The next section shows the accountant stepping out of a car in Tokyo, and explains how every breath and step he takes is precisely calculated and predetermined. He makes no mistakes, takes no chances, and accounts for every significant possibility. A man begins approaching him from across the street, and the accountant determines based on the color of the man's shoes that he's here to kill him. He also determines that, based on the current market price of peaches, that this assassin is not alone. He sees a Japanese man in his mid-fifties with a slight limp who's going bald, meaning that the second assassin is in the third-story window of the wine shop across the street. The accountant adjusts his watch to reflect sunlight into Anthony's eyes, blinding him in his spot in the third-story window. Adam and Olivia are also in pursuit, with them occasionally asking Calvin over the radio for orders. The accountant and two of his guards catch them in an alley, and he stands in the street, asking what he can do for them. He says that he knows they're here to kill him, that they're responsible for terminating Death's contract, and he presumes they want to kill him over an ideological quibble. Adam erupts in anger, and it's clear the accountant is trying to goad him into making a mistake and coming out in the open. Adam eventually does, but he is saved by Olivia just as a sniper attempts to take his head off. The accountant gets away, but none of Calvin's team is harmed. The accountant makes it to his train, running the recent events over in his head, thinking that there was an overwhelming likelihood that one of the assassins should have been taken down by his sniper. He knows that nothing is certain, but the odds of both assassins emerging from that alley unscathed was comparable to a tornado arranging a deck into a house of cards, then back into the same ordered deck. It was nothing short of miraculous. As he boards the train and opens the door to his private room, he finds Calvin sitting in a chair, casually holding a revolver and pointing it at him. The accountant is stunned unable to comprehend the odds of two miracles happening in one day. Calvin explains that his team had been performing actions decided by a coin flip, something the accountant has no chance of accurately predicting. He asks 0512 for the names and locations of the other overseers, but the accountant knows that he's going to end up shot anyways. Calvin accepts this and kills him. Two down, eleven to go. 0511 is known as the liar, due to being the individual in charge of making sure that all the Foundation's efforts are concealed from the world at large. Agent Yu thought for a while that 0511 was a position held by a number of different people simultaneously, but eventually learned that they were all the same person. This is because 0511 is capable of changing their identity at will, but apparently their original identity was Sam Beale a former insurgency agent. Sam was presumed killed after a shipping accident off the coast of Bangladesh, and was found by a fisherman after being underwater for days, if not weeks. The Foundation found them and had tried to rebuild their identity in order to find out info about the insurgency, but they were unable to do so. Instead, they created a large number of other identities, and 0511 became able to flip between them. It was later discovered by Agent Yu that 0511 is capable of exuding an amnestic property at will to those around them, making them unable to remember. Agent Yu speculates that Sam Beale was forever lost in those waters, their memories devoured by SCP-3000, and the Foundation had merely used them as a vessel for a variety of personalities and abilities. The story continues with a flashback, to a time before the Foundation existed. Felix Carter, who would become 0513, is giving a presentation about the nature of reality, how it's composed of threads, and if one were to tug on those threads, you might be able to alter reality. He's also been working with Adam Bright, Jack Bright's father, and they've received funding from Frederick Williams, 
who would go on to found the SCP Foundation. Williams also meets with two other men, Siegel and Arians, and he gives them his business card, telling them to give him a call. In the present, Olivia is standing on a balcony when she's approached by Anthony. They're looking out over Seattle, and it seems that some time has passed since killing the accountant, as they discuss how the Foundation really unraveled afterwards. Something tugs at the back of Olivia's mind as she talks with Anthony, something she seems to be forgetting. She then abruptly ends the conversation by stabbing a knife into Anthony's chest and pushing him off the balcony. She then wakes up in a bed, with Adam tugging on her arm and telling her to get up. Adam asks how much she remembers, and she replies that she remembers having a dream with Anthony in it, taking place years from now. It felt real, but something was off. The more she thought about it, the more she realized it was a lie. Adam seems to commiserate with her, implying he had a similar experience, and says that they apparently planned for this. There were two encrypted video files on his computer that they were supposed to play in this sort of situation. Adam unlocks his video and gestures Olivia to supply her password. She instead snatches a pistol off the nightstand and shoots Adam three times in the head. Olivia again wakes up, this time on a cot in an office, with Calvin standing over her. She quickly knees Calvin in his solar plexus and searches for a hidden pistol that she knows is in Calvin's real office, and she finds it, pointing it at his chest. She pauses to think, recounting the previous two experiences, and how she knew something was wrong each time. Anthony's lighter was different, and Adam used a different name for his computer. She says that to get out of this, she's going to have to kill Calvin, who of course tries to calm her down. She accuses him of being 0511, the liar, but he says that the liar must be tricking her into killing him. He then says that the liar didn't ask her about her copy of the journal, asking if she still has it. Olivia touches her wrist where the digital copy of the journal is embedded, and the liar smiles. Olivia then wakes up in a hospital, strapped to the bed, with a nurse and a doctor face down on the floor nearby. She sees an older woman in a white suit with a gun sitting, then blinks, and instead sees a man with a mohawk, then blinks again, and sees a man with serrated steak knives for teeth. This is the liar, capable of flipping through identities at will, including Anthony, Adam, and Calvin. Olivia's wrist had been surgically cut open, and the digital flash drive had been removed. She had been captured and brought to the liar for questioning, to see how much she knew, but the team had planned for this. The flash drive hadn't contained the whole journal, just the section on 0511. Reading its contents made 0511 remember what had happened to them, how the Foundation had created new identities for them and made them forget about their past in the insurgency. The liar allows Olivia to escape and gives her a flash drive with info on the next target. The liar says that they are not faultless in what they've done, and if the Foundation doesn't kill them, they'll spend the rest of their life running. As Olivia leaves, she hears a single gunshot from behind her. Three down, ten to go. 0510, the archivist, is said by Agent Yu to possibly be the most dangerous person in the world. 0510 was formerly a school teacher named Diane Walters, who earned a reputation for harming students who didn't meet her ridiculous standards of conduct. She also was known for possessing a near-perfect memory, able to recall anything she had ever learned. A person with that capability would of course be sought after by the Foundation, and she soon found herself on the Overseer Council, in charge of all of the Foundation's records, as well as keeping a mental record of practically every activity taken on the planet. A story going around says that she personally handled an innocuous accidental breach of data by brutally torturing the culprit until he admitted to being a spy in order to stop the torture, and he was executed. 
The Archivist is apparently obsessed with the concept of omniscience, and believes the Overseers to be divine entities, far above the rest of humanity. It's said that she's responsible for recreating history after an apocalypse when utilizing SCP-2000, meaning that she has experienced potentially multiple end-of-the-world scenarios and remembers each of them. Agent Yu speculates that in times of crisis, the Archivist will likely retreat into the Wanderer's Library, where she is a frequent but unwelcome guest. The story flashbacks once more, this time to just after the death of the Foundation Administrator at the hands of the children, from Part 1. The primary individuals responsible are Aaron Siegel and Vincent Arians, who we heard about previously when they met with the Administrator at a conference. They both went on to join the fledgling SCP Foundation, with Siegel becoming O5-1. Arians joined Siegel in his defection, along with a number of others, but he's not happy about the situation, as he doesn't understand why the Administrator had to die, as he thought they were just destroying the kingdom of Abaddon. Siegel reveals that there never was a kingdom of Abaddon. There was no army of reality benders in the desert. It was just the Administrator. According to Siegel, the Administrator became something inhuman, capable of bending reality, and believing Siegel to be a kindred spirit, he showed him what he was capable of by leveling an entire Foundation facility himself. Siegel knew that he had to be destroyed, as he wouldn't stop, and that's why Siegel became fully committed to creating the children. Once again, the ends justify the means, or so Siegel believed. The Administrator had started the Children Project just to see if it could be done, and Arians wonders if Siegel believed the same thing. The rest of the defectors believe that the Administrator aligned himself with the Kingdom of Abaddon, and they see Siegel as a hero. In the present, Calvin and Adam are heading into a forest to find the Archivist, while Olivia is dealing with the Liar, and Anthony is getting intel on 059. Calvin says that he plans on shooting the Archivist in the face, and if that fails, he has a secret weapon, but he literally cannot tell Adam what it is. The two come to a place in the forest where two saplings stand side by side, and Calvin explains that this is a way, a tunnel between worlds activated with the right knock, or key. This knock can take the form of a time of day, a specific object you have to carry, a word you have to utter, or a thought you have to be thinking of. This concept should be pretty familiar to those acquainted with the Planescape setting. For this specific way, which leads to the Wanderer's Library, you have to have a piece of knowledge in mind that you're willing to give up, as you'll forget it when you pass through. The knowledge has to be something relatively important to you, so Adam thinks about what THACO stands for, a mechanic used in earlier versions of D&D, and steps through. The two find themselves in a section of the Wanderer's Library, an extra-dimensional space I discussed in my Serpent's Hand video. This section resembles a massive office space, fully equipped with 1980s-era mainframes and computers. The Foundation uses this section to back up all their data, on both our current world and any worlds that came before, all on microfilm. Adam becomes curious about a computer that isn't functioning, and opens it up despite Calvin's protests. Inside is a solitary hard drive spinning, despite no wires connecting to it, and a Davite rune carved into its surface. A librarian appears behind them, one of the native entities of the library capable of navigating its infinite halls. The librarian says that the Archivist is no longer here. She broke her pact with the Serpent by partaking in forbidden knowledge and writing herself into a story to which she does not belong. Instead, she is now down below the library, and the librarian offers to take them to her. The two follow the librarian for what seems like decades, 
as time does not pass the same in the library, until they reach the library's foundation, a massive cavern lined with pillars carved by the serpent itself in the eternity before time. The serpent is not actually a serpent. It's an avatar of a universal facet of reality, information. This foundation is the base of all knowledge, and underneath it is the dark endlessness. The librarian gestures them towards a set of doors, beyond which is the source of all knowledge, and it says that there are three books there that must not be disturbed. Calvin says that he'd like to make a withdrawal, and the librarian pulls out a short metal tube covered in runes. Calvin apparently brought them this tube many years ago, and the librarian says that there are few things that exist that they have no knowledge of, but the contents of that tube are one of them. The two pass through the doors and find themselves on top of a green hill in a valley, with two trees nearby. Under one of them sits a woman in a white dress, eating an apple and reading a book. Calvin approaches, asks if she's the archivist, and then shoots her three times. The archivist doesn't flinch as the bullets pass through her. As Calvin continues to shoot her, she asks if he reads. She says that she reads very often, that you can learn everything there is to learn from books, including how to allow bullets to pass through your body. She admits to being afraid when she heard that 0513 died, as mortality makes her job much harder. She came here to learn the secret of immortality, and she's already done it. She gestures to the trees, saying that one of them is the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and the other is the tree of life, both discussed in the Bible. She says that the serpent made it so that you can only eat from one if you've already eaten from the other, which created a paradox. She learned then that the tree of knowledge doesn't bear fruit because the library is the fruit, and she's learned everything from the library, allowing her to eat from the tree of life. She's read from the three books mentioned by the librarian, the book of life and death, the book of things that have been, and the book of things that will be. As she now knows of all things within the library, just as the serpent does, she proclaims herself to be the serpent. Her body then splits open, revealing a massive writhing serpent inside, who proceeds to attack Calvin and Adam. A fight ensues, with the two unable to harm the serpent, but it says that despite all of its knowledge, it still does not know what is inside of that tube. Adam eventually opens the tube, causing a long spear covered in runes to drop out. The tube then turns into essentially a harpoon gun, and Adam uses it to launch the spear at the serpent's skull, killing it and causing the landscape to fall away into darkness. The landscape soon returns, with both Calvin and Adam alive, and the archivist speared against the Tree of Knowledge. Two figures are standing there. One is the actual serpent, and the other is the serpent's brother, lord of the realm of nothingness. The serpent says that the spear they hold is very rare, as it's the spear of the non-believer. It says that it might be older than the library itself, with a legend stating that it was forged when the first thinking being decided to deny omnipotence. The serpent admits that it can't even see the spear, and Calvin confirms that it was given to him by someone, but doesn't say who. They put the spear back into the tube, and the serpent says that the archivist wasn't that different from the two of them when she first came to the library. It wonders where their convictions will lead them and with a blinding flash, the two find themselves back in the forest. Four down, nine to go. 059 is known as the Outsider, as she was taken directly as a civilian in order to replace the previous 059. She was an Australian geologist that uncovered an anomaly and was discredited by the Foundation to prevent the public from learning about it. 
Her recruitment straight to the council by orders of 057 seems to be entirely to serve the purpose of pissing off half of the council. She is said to be a brilliant researcher though, maintaining several projects simultaneously. Agent Yu has very little to say about her otherwise, as she shouldn't be hard to find or hard to deal with. Another flashback, with Aaron Siegel after founding the Chaos Insurgency. He's uncomfortable, as he presumed that the Foundation would quickly die off with their administrator dead and half the Council gone, but the Foundation was continuing on. The Insurgency has started to raid Foundation sites, but it already seemed like the Foundation was closing in on their headquarters. Siegel gets a phone call from Arians, who informs him that the Broken God fanatics are doing something in South America, an event we're well acquainted with. Siegel is even more distressed to hear that the Foundation is fully mobilizing to deal with the problem, despite his hope that they would be in ruins by this point. Siegel wants to go with Arians to Mexico, to see the children one more time. That night, he has many dreams one in which he and the administrator first open the doors to Site-17, one in which he watches as a truck brings in SCP-173, one in which he establishes a relationship with Sophia Light, who is currently running the Foundation. He dreams of drinking from the Fountain of Youth with the other O5 members, and dreams of the administrator tugging on an ethereal thread, causing the moon to vanish before he brings it back. He dreams of a man laying dead on the ground, his hand clasped around a golden sword, and in the distance, a phone is ringing. In the present, Calvin and Anthony confront 059 in the burned out ruins of her family home. She tells them about how the council informed her of things beyond her wildest dreams when she was recruited. She certainly seems to be the most normal of the council and she understands why they've come. She says that she'll go out in her own way, and produces a switchblade. She finishes by saying that she used to believe that serving a higher cause made for a meaningful life, but now she realizes that any life can be wasted, and any death can be meaningless. Suddenly she locks eyes with Calvin, and he experiences a powerful vision of the house around him restored, a happy family, 059 as she would have been if she had lived a normal life. The vision ends with fire and screams, and he sees her as much older than she was. She's now sitting back in a burnt chair, her wrists slit open. Before she dies, she asks Calvin if he's afraid of death. He responds, no, but with her final words, she says that he's lying. Five down, eight to go. The eighth overseer is known as the Lesser, a rather insulting term, as he's not looked upon favorably by the rest of the council. His real name is Baron Lehman Hoadley, and along with his brother, the two became very wealthy railway industrialists. This wealth allowed the early foundation to compete against other paranormal groups, such as the GOC, preventing them from being snuffed out. His brother ran the railway company, and Baron essentially ran the foundation, as he used his influence on the council to take charge. It's believed that during this time, Baron was using newly created sites to funnel SCPs over to Marshall, Carter, and Dark, receiving kickbacks in return. Tragedy struck, however, when his brother died in a train accident, and Baron found out that he didn't actually control as much of the company as he believed. His brother had written him out of most of the company, and left everything to his son, who had no interest in running a company. The company was sold, leaving Baron much worse off than he used to be. He lost all of his influence on the council, and became incredibly paranoid that the rest of the overseers planned to kill him off. He locked himself in a fortress and began experimenting with anomalies on his own body in order to protect himself. The story continues with Siegel and Arian standing in front of the church in Mexico where the children are buried. 
They hear and see the effects of the broken god in the distance, and the children seemingly call out to Siegel from underneath him. They beg him to come back and make them whole again. As SCP-2399 prepares to destroy the false god in the distance, Siegel steps into the church and hears the sound of a man laughing. In the present, the crew come to the fortress where 058 is supposedly hiding out. They find it to be a smoking ruin, however, filled with charred remains of bodies. They come to what seems to be the epicenter of the damage and find a ruined corpse of a man. Anthony identifies him as Baron Hoadley, and figures that 058 had augmented his body in a number of different ways, and all of these things were kept in check by the Overseer's immortality. When that contract was broken and he became mortal again, the augmentations didn't agree with one another, causing quite an explosion. Six down, seven to go. At camp that night, the group share some of their war stories with Calvin and Olivia talking about how long they've known each other. Olivia admits that she is capable of magic, which she utilized during her anomalous art days. Adam asks Anthony how long he's been around, and Anthony is purposefully vague about exactly how long. Calvin talks about the importance of what they do, of carrying on the engineer's legacy, which Anthony scoffs at. Anthony then reveals that he's much older than they think, as he actually was one of the original defectors that went with Siegel after he killed the administrator. He says that the engineer stabbed the insurgency in the back and went back to the foundation. Anthony drank from the fountain of youth, keeping him young, but he deeply regrets it, and resents the engineer for using the insurgency's idealism for as long as it was useful to him before abandoning them. Everyone else in the insurgency, of course, respects the engineer as the founder of all of their tenets, but they don't know anything about what Anthony is revealing. He goes on to say that when Siegel went back to the foundation, he told them everything he knew about the insurgency, including their facilities and encampments. They set up Delta Command in the aftermath to be purposefully realistic in what they could accomplish. He says that the current Delta Command knows none of this, as telling people would either result in them not believing him, or in people losing faith in the insurgency's goals. Anthony is telling this group because he wants them to know the truth of what they're dying for, that they're doing this because they need to return things to the natural order, not because of what some traitor said decades ago. Later, Calvin is sitting by the fire with the second vial of the Fountain of Youth, and Anthony asks him where he got it from. He explains that when the council ran the fountain dry, there was enough left for twelve vials, just in case. Anthony wonders how he got a hold of two of those vials, and what he plans to do with it. Calvin responds that he's going to destroy it, eventually, which Anthony agrees with, as it extends your life, but makes it empty, without taste or color. Anthony had spent years trying to undo the effects after drinking it, which has finally resulted in him slowly aging again. The two discuss the final words of 059, whether Calvin is afraid of death or not. Anthony says the decision is his, but if it were him, he would destroy that vial and never think of it again. The two go to sleep, with plenty of more work left to do. 057 is the most fearsome member of the Council by reputation, as she is said to be the de facto leader of the O5s. She commonly goes by the codename Green, due to constantly wearing green pantsuits, which seems rather harmless for someone considered by most to be the devil that sits on the Overseer Council. Agent Yu recounts a story of a meeting between a Russian intelligence director and a high-ranking member of the GOC. The GOC wished to go into Syria to act against the Foundation, and hoped to secure Russia's support in the endeavor. The intelligence director assured the GOC that they had their support, until he received a phone call and learned that Green was in Syria. 
The GOC member was furious until he too learned why Russia had backed out. One solitary woman entered the country and sent two massive organizations scurrying. Green seems to personally be involved in a large swath of matters around the world, and Agent Yu claims that she is always watching and always planning. The GOC thought she was working with the factory, the UIU thought she was working for Curvier, and the Russians thought she was the Scarlet King himself. No one knows exactly what her endgame is, but Agent Yu gave her a very, very wide berth. In flashbacks, Adam is rescued from an SCP-610 labor camp by Anthony. Siegel announces a breakthrough to an assembly of the SCP Foundation. Olivia gets rescued from Foundation Pursuit by Calvin. The Broken God gets obliterated by SCP-2399. And the Administrator discovers a waterfall that flows upwards in a hidden cavern, exciting him. In the present, the team is in Cambodia, meeting with another insurgency agent named Vanderveer. The region is under turmoil, as the local revolutionaries are holding an artifact, and Green has personally come to deal with them. Vanderveer explains that an anomalous mining corporation named Curvier came in years back and ended up polluting the water supply. This is something they've done in the past, and they usually just stick around until the Foundation shows up to clear them out, but this time the Foundation didn't show up, due to Calvin's team causing problems. The local officials were receiving kickbacks from Curvier, and are now seen as traitors by the locals. Revolutionaries are using the scandal to overthrow the government, and rioters are flooding the streets and looting everything in sight. Green is coming in to stoke the fires of the Rebellion so that the Foundation can sweep in afterwards and pick up the anomaly that they're holding. The team ends up getting caught in the street by some rioters. The rioters are put down by an MTF from the Foundation. The team attempts to get away, but they get hit with some gas grenades and end up captured by the MTF. Calvin, Olivia, and Adam wake up in the Governor's Mansion now controlled by the Foundation. Green is standing in front of them, and they execute Vanderveer. She commends Calvin for his courage in what he's done so far, and tells him that 0513 was actually worried that someone would come along and do exactly what he did. Siegel had had the Fountain of Youth purposefully drained in order to prevent it, but Calvin found a way to do it anyways, which she applauds. She proceeds to give Calvin a choice. He can either pick one of his team members to die, in which case Green would give herself up, or he can refuse, in which case she'll kill the leader of the revolutionaries, causing a civil war in the region. Calvin chooses himself to die, but Green laughs, saying that there is no such thing as a noble sacrifice. She says that he has no idea what he's doing even if he thinks that he does. She says that if he thinks that killing people will stop the Foundation, he should ask Aaron Siegel about that. Calvin still refuses, so the revolutionary leader is executed, causing a riot outside. As she points a gun at Adam, she is suddenly sniped by Anthony, who tells them to run. It wasn't a fatal shot, and Green makes it to the roof where there's a waiting helicopter. The revolutionaries are storming the mansion now, and Adam clears the way by using the Spear of the Non-Believer, which immolates them and burns the group to ash. They make it to the roof as Green takes off in the helicopter and taunts them. Calvin and Anthony fire on her, to no effect, but a rocket fired by one of the revolutionaries in the streets hits it. Jets begin carpet bombing the city as the crew flees, caught in the middle of this chaos. As they run, they come across the wreckage of the helicopter, and a fiery figure steps out of it, skin melting off, an arm severed, walking on soon-to-be-melted legs. It seems Green isn't quite dead yet, and she steps towards the crew, moaning. She raises a gun at Calvin, but Anthony dives in to take the bullets. Green finally collapses, 
but Anthony is quickly bleeding out. Calvin reaches for his vial of the fountain water, knowing that it will save him, but Anthony begs him not to. He reveals that his original name was Vincent Arians before dying. Olivia uses her anomalous abilities to turn his corpse into a cloud of crystal butterflies, which fly off. The remaining three meet up with an unnamed member of the insurgency, who gives them a car, supplies, and directions to their next target. Seven down, six to go, but now the already small team has lost a very important member. Taking down Green was certainly a big move for the team, but this is an even more uphill battle now. It's clear that the Overseer Council have been involved in some very heinous and shady activities, but there's still plenty of story left to tell, as Calvin and his crew close in on 051.